Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton. This week, Greg and Joe and the rest of the regular gang, they're all on vacation, summer vacation, someplace doing stuff or working, actually, uh, since we're recording at a different time this week than we normally do. But in their place, we have some heavy hitter guests that I'm very excited to introduce to you, including Emmy-nominated film and television editor and a big dog enthusiast, Maura Corey. Hello, Maura. Hey, Kevin. How are you doing today? I am doing great, and I cannot wait to learn more about you. We're just actually meeting on Zoom for the first time today, but I do know that you are, as I said, you've done a lot of editing of uh, films and television shows. You've been nominated for an Emmy, and your credits include uh, the TV series Manifest and a current TV series that I've been hearing a lot about, ironically, called Kevin Ken Fuck Himself. That is the title of the show, folks. I'm not cursing just for the heck of it, but we're going to talk about that more. If anybody has seen that show, you'll probably want to hear Maura's take on what it's like behind the scenes there. And we we also have, and I'm just as happy to have him here, a a good Facebook friend of mine who I originally met through the, the group Open Fire Politics and Entertainment that we talk about a lot on this show. And we've then become kind of political buddies who trade observations about politics all day long these days, it seems, right, Charles? But he is a professional in the accounting and the economics industry who has even done some tax work in affiliation with the IRS, who happens to be in the news this week. So for that reason and many others, I'm thrilled to introduce to you Charles Kaminsky. Hi, Charles. Hello, Kevin. How are you today? Doing great. So we're going to be talking to our guests about their various backgrounds and especially talking about um, the television industry with Maura, since that is her primary area of expertise. I don't know that we're going to get to dogs today, Maura, but you know, <laughs> yeah, we can save that for another episode. We want to talk about what's happening in the world this week, and there's a lot going on. Now, I got to say, it's tempting to start with the story that everybody's talking about about that person whose name at this point will go unmentioned. Mm -hmm. But because I was watching some news coverage this morning and somebody appropriately pointed out, maybe we shouldn't be making him the first news story in Mm -hmm. everything that we hear these, these days, because it's giving him too much clout and too much attention. So let's talk a little bit about the economy and the fact that it looks like it might be tilting the Democrats way just as we approach the midterms. So, Charles, I'm going to start with you, because this is a little bit more in the sweet spot of your background. What do you think of the new bill that apparently the president is going to be signing any day now? And specifically, what do you think about some of the events that have happened recently, including the Fed raising interest rates three quarters of a point? Well, the interest rate, I would oppose. The rate hike. The rate hike is going to help uh, control inflation reason why I don't think it's going to control inflation is because there's a cost to businesses to borrow money. When you increase that cost for a business, they usually pass it on to the customer. So you're not going to see a cut. You're not going to see a cut in prices by raising interest rates. Another right. issue that I have with raising interest rates is in the home buying sector. A lot of times when people buy houses, They don't look at the amount that they're taking out to get a house. They're looking at what their mortgage payment would be in comparison to what they're currently paying in rent and if it's affordable. So what happens is when you increase the interest rates, they're still seeking the same amount for payment uh, or monthly payment, but the asking price from, from the seller point of view goes down. Yeah. So, so then what, what is happening with the interest rates is the person that would sell their house mm-hmm. for 325000 is now asking two ninety five. So you've got, um, they're losing um, $30,000 out of their pocket from their house sale and that the banks are actually going to end up pocketing that in the long run. 
Uh, I'm smiling because obviously it varies from location to location, but I think a lot of people heard asking price of 325 going down to 295 (laughs) and they thought, in what world does that still exist? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, I was just trying to use- No, 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 no. We know what you, we, we understand that your numbers were just examples. We get it. But I find your point very interesting because you and I had discussed this actually earlier this week. And, right. you know, I pointed out to you that it's somewhat counterintuitive and counter to the prevailing wisdom, the prevailing wisdom of economics, because prevailing wisdom is that cutting interest rates does help one curb inflation. But you must agree that it looks like inflation, at least this past month, has started to tick down. Certainly gas prices are coming down. And doesn't that seem like it's pretty good news for the Biden administration and for Democrats running in congressional districts uh, going into the midterms? Well, I don't see the economy doing good as a partisan thing. If the economy does good, it does good for the whole nation. Yes, it's true. With with that said, I think the economy is is doing well, but the interest rate hikes might actually hurt them or hurt the recovery. Down, down the line. line. Down the mm-hmm. line. But it, it is interesting. I do think, though, that the economy, sadly, is a partisan issue because, you know, Republicans do harp on the right wing harps on the economy as being a reason to vote people out, which I agree with your general sense, Charles, that it shouldn't be and that it helps the whole country. But unfortunately, people attach economy to administrations, which is ridiculous. Which is absolutely ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's economy cyclical and it shouldn't be, it has nothing to do with who's in charge, yeah. frankly. So, uh, and before we get off this topic, one thing that I wanted to touch on this week is I don't like watching Fox News, but I do it like eating yeah. my vegetables because, yeah. not that it's good for me, but because I feel I need to know what the other side is saying and what they're feeding to the masses. And in watching Fox News this week, when they weren't, uh, their heads weren't blowing up over the the Trump Miralago raid, which we're going to talk about in a minute, they kept talking about the 87,000 new IRS agents that they believe will be hired when this new um, anti-inflation bill, whatever they're calling it, the Democrats are calling it, is passed because it has some $80 billion dollars in money for the IRS to hire new agents. Mm -hmm. And I want to speak to that for a moment. Now, Charles, I know you, as an accountant, have done some work for the IRS in conjunction with the IRS. You didn't work for the IRS, but you've got a a window into their means and methods. I just want to tell everyone that's listening to this that when you hear the number 87,000, it is false. It is a lie. There is nothing in the bill that mentions 87,000 people. Someone on the right, some senator or someone in the right wing echo chamber, took the number $80 billion, did some quick math and figured out that, well, I guess if you break that down, that would give them enough money to hire 87,000 new agents. That's not the way it works. The IRS right now only has about 78,000 employees. They're not doubling the size of the IRS. They're trying to get back to the manpower number they were at about five or 10 years ago, which was around 100,000. So they're trying to add about 20,000 new auditors. The rest of the hires and the rest of the money is going for technical improvements, people who have the technical savvy to build them new systems, to track where the money for tax revenues are going. A lot of that is it's housekeeping work. It is not going out and auditing people. Yeah, um, basically the the thing about the the eighty seven thousand that's that's a bit of a high number. And just uh, get some. It's a ridiculously high bit of a high. I number. was um, I was a volunteer for the uh, VITA program to do taxes when I was um, in school for uh, for students and for um, lower income people. That's that's my interaction with them. I've also worked with CPA for uh, at a CPA firm in the past, and one of the big problems with um, CPA firms and the IRS is you spend a lot of time on the phone listening to 
Thank you for calling the IRS. Your call is important to us. We'll be right with you and stuff like that. Sometimes you're waiting for an hour and 45 minutes just to get somebody to take your call. So the the hiring of additional agents or the hiring of additional personnel, you're going to see an increase in the type of service you get out of the IRS. So the people who are the firm, the CPA firms at these businesses are hiring the, the call the IRS and stuff like that. I'm not going to say that you're billed for that hour hour and 45 minutes while we wait for the <laughs> phone call, but I'm not going to say that you're not billed either. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, right. But to be able to hire more people, to be able to get better service. The other thing, the lag time, you're seeing a lot of lag time at the IRS now is people who are using paper returns instead of right. doing e-returns and stuff like that. Right. Those things are a little bit more tedious to process and everything like that. And they're a little bit behind in processing that and getting those those uh, refunds out. So you'd get an increase of personnel to be able to uh, process refunds a lot better, too. So it's not like they're hiring an audit militia to go out and collect all this money like like the Romans would do or something like but that. But that, that's how it's being portrayed. Yeah. But, but it's that not. There's, they're trying to make the, you know how they say the kinder, friendlier IRS, which I don't think anyone's ever going to. Isn't that an oxymoron? <laughs> yeah, but but the they're trying to make the IRS a little bit more more functional with with the uh, with the public. You also got to remember, this is a growing country. There's more people in here. There's more people working. There's more businesses and stuff like that. So you're going to need a bigger agency personnel wise to be able to cater to those to those needs. Right, right. And, and another thing that I want to point out before we move on to other topics is in the right wing's attempt to fire up their base about these 87,000 agents who are going to be hired, I saw someone who actually posted a screenshot of a couple of lines from a job description for an auditor from the IRS website. And one line in the job description says, if you're, you know, want to be considered to be hired as an IRS agent, that you have to be willing to be trained in how to use a firearm and willing to carry a firearm. And they're using that to kind of give people this idea that the IRS is now going to be toting guns as if (sighs) we should all be worried about several thousand more armed accountants coming into our homes. So why is it that the Republicans want to arm kindergarten teachers, yeah. but they don't want IRS, uh, IRS, IRS, IRS agents? I love, IRS agents. I love that, that <laughs> point, Charles. They, they, want, they want to arm the kindergarten teachers, but they don't want to arm the uh, IRS agents. <laughs> this podcast was <laughs> is, is worthwhile for that alone. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's now go to the other kind of agents that carry guns, FBI agents, and talk yeah. about... What I like to call, of course, no one under 60 will know this reference. I like to call it the Radon and and Tubby, (laughs) as opposed to the Radon and Tebby. So everybody now uh, is talking about this story. The right-wing echo chamber is up in arms. Their hair is on fire this week because of the gross miscarriage of justice of actually subpoenaing a former president's records that he wrongfully took out of the White House that have top secret documents in them, and then using a uh, an FBI raid to get them back. So with that in mind, what do you guys think about some of the, the crazy, uh, I'm calling it crazy, but what do you guys think about some of the stuff being said on the right side of the, the echo chamber about why this was such a gross violation of all of our individual rights? You know, for me, it's so funny, this idea that the party of law and order has now become the party of conspiracy, the party of hyperbole. It's the party of defund the FBI. (laughs) Which is insane. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene is just a banana pants. I mean, the the fact she even started doing that, it just it makes me laugh the irony that they rail against woke culture, but yet they adopt everything about woke culture, defund, you know, taking from defund the police, defund the FBI, that. Trump is somehow above the law. 
that anything that is done to him can't be real because it's he's such a victim. It's that party of victimhood that just drives me nuts. Oh, my sense is not that they so much because they won't come out and say that, obviously. Yeah. I don't think they're actually making the point that he's above the law. They're making the point that the law, it doesn't really apply in this instance. Uh, he, You know, they used to say when he when he said something ridiculous that was, you know, insulting to someone, they said, oh, he was just joking, even right. though we know he wasn't joking when he said it. Right. Um, but that's what I'm saying. He applied that the laws never applied to when it comes to him. Right. Well, uh, you know, they see it as these are just some papers that he took home. They're mm. like Charles, like you taking home some uh, tax returns to look at them in your office at home overnight. They don't put together that these are documents that aren't supposed to travel out of a skiff outside yeah. of the White House or the the, the uh, Situation Room. And the other thing that I find humorous about this is even if you buy the argument that a president can willy-nilly de facto de- declassify. Uh, declassify something, even if you buy that argument, why would you want a president of the United States who so casually and so irresponsibly declassifies material that clearly, even if he declassified it, we don't want that material in the wrong hands. Regardless of its classification, it's material that shouldn't be floating out in public where the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians can get their hands on it. Or a busboy. I mean, we're talking about Mar-a-Lago. This isn't exactly well, of lockdown, you know? But a busboy who then can turn around and sell it to the wrong people. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and by the way, as you guys know, they have had a Chinese spy in Mar-a-Lago. There was a problem already there. So it's not like this is some safe environment. And again, the implication that, uh, well, the Secret Service is there to protect it. That's not what they do. No. They're not there protecting Trump's records. So I- I'm now rambling. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in on this? The thing about the, the, the raid is it has increased Trump's popularity. Well, I want to talk about that, but go ahead. He was he was waning. And now all of a sudden he is the news again for the party and everybody's lining up behind him and not talking about replacing him. And it really puts the Republicans in a bind because their platform for 2024 is going to uh, Trump's platform in 2024, which is essentially going to be the Republican Party's platform is they treated me wrong for illegally possessing top secret documents. And now I need to get reelected so I can abuse my power to get back at the people who got me. (laughs) That's going to be his platform. Yeah. Well, I I will say this. First of all, I'm, I'm laughing and smiling when you say that because there's so much truth to it. You know, I've been saying for the last two years that Trump is going to be the Republican nominee because there's just not anybody in the party that could that could beat him in a primary campaign. Mm. This week, I actually softened a little bit on that. I actually personally believe that contrary to public opinion and contrary to what you're hearing on Fox News, I don't think this week helped him. And yes, is he getting more publicity this week than he was uh, the week before? No doubt about it. Are there segments of his highly committed, highly devoted following who are now even more devoted to him because of this? Of course. But has this brought him any new voters? Has this softened the interest of people who who believe in the Democratic agenda? Have they kind of now said, well, I really like what Biden is doing on the economy. I don't like the fact that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. But boy, this Trump raid, I think I'm going to vote for him now. I don't think that's happened. And I think I think that the, that Fox and the other right wing analysts made a critical mistake in judgment this week if they think that this raid has increased his popularity. Now, I have a more cynical view on what happened this week. I think that Marco Rubio and Rick Scott and anybody else who has spoken on this in defense of Trump and saying the FBI is out of control and all of that bullshit. I think they know it's bullshit. I think they're just trying to gin up voter turnout for 2022. I think once the midterms are over, they're going to bail on him quick, especially 
if this story gets worse for him, and it seems to get worse for him by the day. Yeah, I, I think they're jumping on what the narrative they what narrative they want to spin off of this. Exactly. I agree with you that they were trying to bolster 2022. And it is because they jumped on it so fast. They wanted to be able to, to maximize the um, impacts for voter turnout as opposed to waiting for the facts to come out because the story is far from over. Exactly. Far from over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the other the other he, thing, yes, you got to re- consider is that the Republicans are going to continue to back Trump as long as they're winning elections. Mm. So if they're backing Trump and they win the House in November, they're going to continue to back him. The only way they're going to abandon him is if it if it shows up and no donations coming in or if they're losing elections. Yeah, it's a good point. So yep. as long as they continue to win elections, they're going to continue to prop him up. And even though it's disingenuous to call him a martyr, uh, helps them win elections, they're going to go ahead and do that. Yeah, he has yep. to become a, a real cancer for them to abandon that 3% they, they, that take him over the top. Right. They have to actually feel uh, consequences for backing him. And there hasn't been any consequences for backing them. They got a split Senate right now. Mm -hmm. It looks like that they're going to take the House. So they think that this is this is the way to go because they're winning elections with him. Yeah. And that's a good segue to the next topic I wanted to talk about, which is an election that's coming up this coming Tuesday, the Liz Cheney primary in Wyoming. Yeah. Where at this point in time, it looks like she's got a very uphill battle to hold on to her seat and, and to indeed get the nomination for her seat from her party. That said, what do you guys think is her political future if she does not hold on to her seat? I think that she, if the party ever feels to create an identity of the, that they have moved on from Trump, she would be the perfect candidate for them to shift to to say, look, we're over Trump because look at what Cheney did with the with the uh, January 6th committee and all that other stuff. And we're behind her now. OK, so let me throw this at you, because as you can already sense, uh, I think I come up with my little my little conspiracy theories. I come up with my <laughs> little political. They're not conspiracy theories, but I come up with my own like political uh, ideas or predictions all day long that I try to think out of the box. So let's all put on our Liz Cheney hat for a minute, okay? We're about to lose an election and we're about to lose the uh, political office that we that we hold because of Donald Trump. And we're pissed about it, right? Mm, mm-hmm. We think that him being reelected president of the United States is about the worst thing that could happen to our country. And we also want to stop it personally just to get back at him, right? So now you're Liz Cheney. Do you try to run for president in the primary, knowing that the odds of the party turning to you are slim? Do you want to give him yet another victory to say, oh, I beat her ass in the primary as well? I don't think she wants to do that. Yeah. Here's what I think she's going to play for. If you really want to hurt Donald Trump, you wait and see if he gets the nomination. And if he does, you want to make sure that he doesn't get elected president, right? Yeah. I don't think she's going to run third party as the lead candidate either. I think there will be someone else who will mount a third party campaign against Trump, a la Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. And I think that they will ask her to be their vice presidential candidate. Oh. That's where I think you're going to see Liz Cheney. So That's maybe maybe it'll be a John Kasich. Maybe it'll be an H- Asa Hutchinson, uh, or who knows who might step up to do it. I don't think it would be Romney, but someone with a, a name and with some clout in the Republican Party will show up to run against Trump third party, not because they think they're going to win the presidency, but because they know that him getting reelected would be the cancer on this country that we would never survive. And I think that they will turn to her to be their vice presidential running mate. I I think that's a really cool theory. I mean, I, per, me personally, though, I I never see a conservative being able to put woman first ticket. It's just it just doesn't work. It's usually you know. Well, John McCain did. So who would? No, first, uh, oh. not 
Oh, like, the college I don't, ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I, I can totally that's... see vice president, but yeah, because... you, you know, women, yeah, right. women. Yeah, because they're still living in the 1950s yeah. where a woman yeah. has to be second to a man. Sure. Exactly. Speaking, well, you know. speaking of vice presidents, who would Trump's not taking Pence again? Who would be Trump's vice president candidate? That's a great question. Great, Great question. question. Now, my instinct is to say he'd probably look for somebody, uh, you know, a female, somebody like a Nikki Haley. But I have a, I have a different theory on that as well. And this goes back to when Kevin McCarthy started ringing the Trump uh, bell again about a year or so ago and even showed up in Miralago mm-hmm. the night that he came out with some big pro-Trump comments I think that Trump has dangled the vice presidency in front of Kevin McCarthy. And here's why. Kevin McCarthy, barring some political tsunami, Kevin McCarthy is going to be the next Speaker of the House. He will be the Speaker of the House when the votes are getting counted in 2024 Mm. or 2025, January of 2025. And I think Trump wants somebody who's really motivated to be controlling that count because Kamala Harris will be the vice president ostensibly running the show there. But Mm -hmm. the speaker has a lot of control behind the scenes in terms of what slates are put in front of the vice president, how the House votes on slates to recognize or not recognize. So I think there's a lot of political benefit, even though California is not a state that Trump is ever going to win. I think there's a lot of political benefit in picking representative and future Speaker of the House, and then will be present Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, as his vice presidential running mate. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good theory. I mean, it's it's going to be a loyalist. We know that, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it has to be. He can't deal. Again, I don't think Trump could. I don't. I, again, I know it's maybe my feminist side harping on this. There's no way he's going to pick a woman at all, unless it's its daughter. And that's that's another possibility that I've always thought that he might try to make her next in line. Yeah, that, that's or, really interesting. Well, OK, so we've kind of covered politics. We don't want to get to the point where we're pulling our hair out over Donald Trump. And especially since Moore is here, but also because Charles I know that, you know, we all these days when we're not living on Facebook or when we're not working, we're spending a lot of time watching whatever the streaming networks are pumping into our homes. So with that in mind, first of all, Maura, I want to ask you a little bit about the show that you're working on now. You are currently an editor on the show. Kevin can go F himself. I won't say the full title. Tell us a little bit about that series, maybe for people who haven't seen it, what makes it unique and your role in bringing that show to the airwaves. Sure. It's premiering August 22nd, which is going to be uh, its final second season, final season. And the show was created by this fabulous woman named Valerie Armstrong. Valerie Armstrong created this show after watching Kevin Can Wait, which is a three-camera sitcom with Kevin James. It's the fat guy, hot wife, Yes. Sitcom. Right. And that, taking that kind of TV trope and turning it yeah. on its ears. Anyway, on the actual show, mid-season, uh, the woman who was playing his wife, Erin Hayes, wasn't testing well. So they killed her off. You're talking now about the, the Kevin Can Wait series and how they replaced the actress mid-season. And brought in his old castmate from King of Queens, which was Leah Remini, right. and replaced her. And Valerie created a show around this. Sort of like the disposability of women. Yes. It's a look at the patriarchy through the lens of genre. So the show has two different genres. It's got a a multi-cam section and a single cam section. The multi-cam section is with her husband, who is this Kevin fat guy, jolly, very patriarchal, very... um, Very misogynistic. Misogynist. A a kind of a, a... cliche television husband who doesn't abuse, but mistreats his wife on a regular basis. Yeah. He's just all about himself. And when she's not around him, it then shifts to a single camera dramedy and becomes a very dark comedy about uh, season one, which is out is how she plans to murder him uh, to get out of this marriage. (laughs) 
<laughs> season two is I'm, I can't give any spoilers no, don't away. Give, You're just don't gonna give have away to watch spoilers. the season. And it's about her basically becoming an independent creature. So uh, I started watching uh, just the pilot episode last night. So I have uh, ways to go in the series. But what I did see and what everybody sees when they when they find this series is it's extremely creative and unique because you're blending two subgenres of comedy. You're mm-hmm. blending, as you called it, the multi-camera, what we would call the classic sitcom with a, with an audience, a studio audience that shot in three or four sets in a studio yeah. with multi-cameras and usually has a much brighter look to it yeah. versus a single camera, more like a movie type of show, yeah. which is more in the norm these days. You don't see a lot of multi-camera shows. You're mostly seeing single camera shows that are really shot like films yeah. and they have their own tone to them. And your series is trying to bridge that gap and blend those two. And I find it very creative. I'm not sure that I find that it's clicking on all cylinders in every scene, but I certainly give it props for trying. One of the things when I was working on it, I was a little worried about the whiplash you would get switching from one genre to the other. However, I think it it works really well based on the fact that it is such a harsh turn from this, you know, studio laughing. Isn't this hilarious? Like like high key slapstick kind of comedy into this dark delve into this woman's depressing life outside of this set. So I think in that term, it it works as a uh, genre blending. Sometimes genre blending can be tough, but I think it works in all of them. What what I struggle with a little bit, and again, I'm not criticizing the show. I I kind of look at all TV through my own individual lens, and I've got a lot of experience writing television comedy for better or for worse. (laughs) But what what sometimes bumps me is when a show or a sketch comedy show tries to parody what they think multi-camera sitcoms are because the parody sometimes is just way over the top. And and you guys, and when I say you, I'm talking about the writing staff and producers. You don't write the material. But um, the people who are, uh, you know, uh, the above the line talent, I think they're trying actually to write a well-crafted half hour. That's a a potentially believable sitcom, but it's still sometimes in the execution for me personally smacked a little bit more of parody and Mm. satire, but, but then again, I've only seen less than an episode. So uh, I'm not going to pass judgment on the full series yet. I want to see more. It is a really crazy, it is a very different style of acting and a very different style of editing when you do multi-cam versus single cam. Right. So again, we're going to turn to other shows, but it's called Kevin Can F Himself. Now, the I, I understand that uh, Maura told me before the podcast that in the offices, they use the full word there. But generally, when you see it in print, for obvious reasons, they will not have the all four letters of the name uh, of the word. But uh, Kevin Can F Himself is the series it can be found. I found it on Amazon Prime. Any other outlets where people can find it? It does air on AMC, but I think uh, right now season one is only on streaming on Prime. Okay, great, great. And I'm curious about, now that we've talked about that, uh, other shows that people might be watching this week. And I'm going to start with one that uh, I've been binge watching with my wife, Jessica, We've gotten into the show Yellowstone. Now, again, I know Yellowstone premiered in 2018. I'm like four years behind the times here, but we're just finding that show. We're well into season three now. And I got to say, I feel embarrassed because I am hooked on this show. And yet there is so much about it I dislike. <laughs> Has, and maybe that's, maybe that's what the nature of television is, that you're supposed to watch it and, and be angry while you're watching it. But, I don't know. I call it shame watching. Yeah. Like, I can't believe I'm watching this. What am I doing? And especially as a, as a born and bred New Yorker and former Californian who has now found himself living in the heartland in Texas, central Texas, I live amongst people who probably have more Western roots than I ever did. And uh, I know this is a very popular series amongst my neighbors. And I often wonder what it is that they identify with this horrible, horrible cowboy who is the patriarch of this family, who seems to have some kind of morality morality and ethics, but breaks it in 
every single scene of every episode, he breaks his own morality and ethics. Maybe not every scene, but you know what I'm saying. But again, I, I put you at a disadvantage because I understand you guys really aren't familiar with that show yet. I haven't seen if- it. Yeah, it's Kevin Costner, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's. Let me put it this way. Have you seen Succession? Yeah. Okay. It's Succession with cowboy hats and guns. Love it. That's basically it. And a lot of fist fights. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of horses. <laughs> Succession, however, is a much more nuanced and much more sophisticated series. Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to save my Yellowstone, the rest of my Yellowstone rant for some time when someone else who has actually seen the show (laughs) can tell me how wrong I am and say, Kevin, go fuck yourself. (laughs) But let's turn to other shows that people are watching this week. Uh, Maury, you told me that you've got a couple that's been on your radar and you've been enjoying. Yeah, I just finished a show that I thought was phenomenal on FX called The Bear, which I've heard is of it. just crafted. If anybody's worked in the service industry, I used to wait tables. It just nails what it's like to be working in a kitchen or at a restaurant. It is insanely intense. And they did a great job of rolling out the plot really slowly. They rolled out the plot very slowly to get a more character study versus uh, cliffhanger, 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 cliffhanger. It's a comedy, sort of. It's more of a dramedy. I highly recommend it for anybody who's who really likes more of an artistic, but but good show. It's about it's basically about this guy who runs a Italian Italian beef store in Chicago. Right, right. So, a topic that I wanted to discuss with you, Mora, is something that um, we started touching on on uh, in our Facebook interactions earlier today, or I should say, our private messenger interactions, which is the changing timing and the evolution of entertainment, filmed and television entertainment in America over time. And let me put this in context for our audience who may not understand what I just said. If you think about it, human beings, we started with plays. We started with actors putting on a play in front of people. That was as far as technology took us. (laughs) Then people invented film and we, we went to movies, which were plays that were that were one-off stories that were put on film so many people could see it all over the country or all over the world. Then you get to radio, which created the idea of a series, taking a group of characters and having them tell different stories each week, but with the same characters. Okay, that's a series. And then, of course, television ran with that and created the TV series, the one-hour drama, the half-hour comedy. And then, of course, film saw some potential box office bonanzas with that, and they invented the sequel. So they could take recurring characters and create no, new stories. Uh, Maverick, uh, the Tom Cruise movie that builds on uh, Top Gun, being a perfect example of that. Although there were only it was only one returning character, I guess, in that one. But, but many of the sequels use the same characters over and over again. Now we have streaming, which also does have series with recurring characters. But Maura, as an editor, maybe you notice this. The nature of storytelling seems to be changing oh, yeah. from what the networks gave us each week, which was the characters you love telling a new story this week that has a beginning, middle, and end. And then next week, it's going to be a different story. Now we're, we're sort of taking the soap opera dynamic, which is an ongoing storyline, ongoing arcs, but it's changed again in streaming. Have you perceived that? A thousand percent. I mean, binge watching has changed how series are structured uh, because every episode they want you to click on to the next one. And you're basically consuming what used to be week to week and you'd have to wait for it. You're consuming an entire 10 hour story in, in a day or two where it's, you know you used to have to wait each week. The other thing I find interesting is streaming. There is no um, time clock. So, and what I mean by time clock is network TV. If you're working on an hour long show, it's 42 minutes. So it's from top to bottom, it's 42 minutes. And then the commercials fill out the rest of the hour. So you only have 42 minutes. If you go over 42, you have to cut stuff out that gets you to the 42 minutes. So there may be story points or the way you tell a certain moment in time differently because you have to hit 42 streaming it's willy nilly. So you can be 
at 48, 56. You're going to see some shows like at, at an hour three, which can change the tenor of how you create and tell stories. Not can. It absolutely does. Yeah. And, and, and I wanna, not for the better either, by the I way. I agree. Not for the better. What, what I find, and I'm still working through these observations and have been for a while as I speak about them out loud. What I'm finding is, is that um, the art of telling a story used to be keep your story moving, have some really interesting developments, plot twists, obstacles that you throw in the way of your characters. Now, for some reason, they're padding series. And I find that I could watch the first two episodes of a, of a one-hour drama. And again, the word one-hour loose because it's not always one hour. Yeah. And, and I can pick it up at episode five and not really have missed anything. And sometimes you could pick it up toward the end of the season and not really have missed anything because they're padding the episodes just to get a full order of 10. Um, have you noticed that? You know, that's interesting. I, I think that's, I'm not 100% sure I agree with that. I do think, though, having only 10 episodes versus the 22 you would have in the earlier days actually harms part of the storytelling, too. Because then what happens is, is, and maybe this goes to your point, instead of making a pilot episodes that's really concise, they'll take all the elements of a pilot and put it over yes. three episodes. Yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And for yeah. me, it's just like, let's really, if you're, you're going to tell a story, try to really narrow it in as opposed to creating a full arc. That's why I think shows like Breaking Bad are so brilliant. So basically they took the time in the right way to have this character, Walter White, through what it was at five seasons, you see his origin story over five seasons. It's incredible. It's just an incredible piece of art. Um, but then there's other things that, you know, I won't go into who's who, yeah. but that definitely don't tell a story concisely. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. I, I, was, used to, I, was, I used to write sketch and it would be like, you can do five pages, but you really should do three because that's going to be funnier and better and sharper. Sorry, Charles, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Going to his padding point, I don't think the padding goes on early on. I think the padding goes in if it's a 10 episode season that uh, episode eight and episode nine can be a little bit thin just so they can have that real good closing for uh, for. The finale for, um, yeah. for the finale. So I do see it stretch out a little, but I don't see it in the beginning. I see it more towards the end once it's, and then you're just watching it. So you watch every episode. Fair as, point. As and I probably was, I think, I think you've actually corrected me and properly. I think what I said by episode three, you can, you could start missing. I think you're right. It's more like once you get to episode five and on, it starts getting thin. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it gets a. It's like that with Handmaid's Tale. You, you watch it, and yeah. it's just like it's the same thing over. It's it's like a loop over and yeah. over and over again yeah. until they can get to their season finale. Yeah, you know it's and, interesting yeah. though, because like Handmaid's Tale, the season one was basically the book. So seasons two and three and four were just complete like new material. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Thanks. Yeah. 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 And and uh, again, as as a storyteller, I see a lot of cheating going on that probably the audience doesn't care about. And I, I don't want to go too too far into the weeds. But one thing that drives me crazy is as a writer constructing a story, you want to put believable and difficult obstacles in your character's way that they can overcome in a unique and creative way. Sometimes I'll be watching a show and I'm going to go back to Yellowstone, which again, I know you guys haven't seen, <laughs> but there is a, there is a subplot about a sibling rivalry between a brother and a sister. And the sister is constantly demeaning and breaking down her brother for reasons from their past that I won't go into, but she is always one-upping him with the cruelest. And I mean, the cruelest insults that you can imagine right up until trying to plant the idea in his head that he should commit suicide. That's how dysfunctional this relationship is. And what drives me nuts is the man that she's doing it to, her brother, is a Harvard-educated lawyer, and he is depicted in the series as being a really, really sharp lawyer out in the world. Yet in the face of his sister, he never has a single comeback. He can never even just say to her, screw you, you, you know what, you know? 
he just sits there and takes it and he's he's stammering all the time hemming and hawing when it's so obvious he has things that he could say about her that would put her in her place now again for you guys this means nothing for the audience who do know that I'm talking about Jamie and Beth and do know their relationship they know what I'm saying but anyways that's that's something that bugs me and I see that a lot these days in television shows it's a cheat and it bugs the heck out of me as a writer mm. And with that, I'm getting off my uh, five-inch high soapbox. (laughs) I want to thank you guys. Believe it or not, we've already covered almost an hour of time. By the time I edited this down, it'll be a very tight three minutes. No, I'm only kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Maura, it has been a delight having you on and talking about television and other subjects with you. And Charles, this has been long overdue, and I thank you for being here. We want to say to our audience that if you if you miss the regular gang, don't worry. Greg and Joe and the rest of the gang will be back in future episodes. Also, like I said, Charles and I originally met in Open Fire Politics and Entertainment. That's where we go to talk about politics between shows. And if you're interested in discussing politics with people like us or even with us, please go and find the group, join it, and uh, maybe... You and Charles and me and Maura can be in a uh, thread together later this week discussing any of these topics. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening. Have a great week. We'll see you the next time this more perfect union of ours gets any less perfect. (laughs) 